Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Kirsten Logan. I'm the training coordinator at COBA. And I am thrilled to be joined today by Adrian Van Nice from the Boulder DA's office here in Colorado, as well as Wendy Patrick and Tracy Pryor, our wonderful colleagues at the San Diego DA's office. So a couple of housekeeping matters, and then we're gonna get right to our presenters. Uh, this presentation is being recorded. This is a listen only uh, presentation, and I'll talk you through uh, how to type and get an answer to your questions in just a moment. So you will get an email later today, which is your proof of attendance for this 90 minute webinar. Please keep it for your records. And if you are applying for COVA's victim advocacy certification here in Colorado, you'll need to submit that email with your packet. If you are watching this webinar online later, we do hope you find the information useful. However, please note that archived webinars may not be used for COVA's victim advocate certification. Your toolbar is likely compressed at the moment. Um, so there is an orange box or an orange bar with a white arrow top right of your screen. When you click that out, you'll see handouts pane with a little white arrow. Click that and you'll find the handout that our presenters have provided for us. Um, your view should also show questions slash chat. And so to send a question, you're gonna go ahead and type, you know, expand that and type there. And our presenters uh, are gonna go ahead and take questions at the end. If you're having any kind of audio problem or any difficulty, still go ahead and type in the chat for me, Kirsten, and I'll, I'll respond to you and should be able to help you with that. As we get towards the end as well, I'm going to provide a link to our evaluation, and I know our presenters are always very appreciative to receive your feedback. Um, and with that, uh, Tracy, I think we're ready to go. Okay, well, thank you so much, Kristen, and it's our pleasure to be here with you today. My name is Tracy Pryor. I have the privilege of serving as a Chief Deputy in the San Diego County District Attorney's Office, and I, along with my colleagues, Wendy Patrick from San Diego, as well as Adrian Van Eyck from Boulder County, are um, thrilled to be with you today. We're going to have a dialogue, really, about building a culture of best practices in domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking. Wanted to take just a minute to thank all of you on the line for the work that you do. Um, you're in the trenches, as we all are, in this craft, um, which is continually changing, continually evolving, and we'd love to learn from you as well in this seminar. So feel free to place anything in the chat um, that you want to talk about, and, and we'll save some time at the end. I've been a prosecutor for 24 years. Uh, started out my journey actually as a student working in a temporary restraining order clinic and realized right away that there was so much I needed to learn and um, has just been drawn to this, this area and these survivors, um, they keep me going as they do many of you on this call as well. They're fantastic, they're resilient, they're brave, they're courageous, and uh, you just wanna work and, and do your best for them. So we're gonna talk about some best practices today that are all geared towards those survivors and towards the victim voice. And we hope that you can take away just, just one nugget maybe back to your own uh, offices and if you have any questions you just let us know and we'll try to gear you towards a contact or a referral uh, to the best we can. Today's roadmap we'll talk just a little about the genesis of this this programming which was the National District Attorneys Association we have a women prosecutor section and that's what uh, generated some of these white papers or these position papers that lend these best practices and we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also discuss uh, best practices in the area of domestic violence, some of them, and uh, as well as sexual assault and human trafficking. And just start a conversation really with all of you about things that are working, things that um, you might not have thought about uh, until today. Your NDAA women section, essentially that was a, a group of, of women who were part of a larger organization and came together in about 2015 and started a, a women's section. And the goals of the section are to assist the National DA's Association in public engagement and education on issues particular uh, to the importance of women prosecutors, which really ties in so um, closely with uh, some of the issues that all of our survivors face. And so we as a section decided that we would put forth some position papers, uh, one of them being in domestic violence. And that's what I'll be talking about today. My colleagues will be uh, pass the, I'll pass the torch to them and they'll talk about human trafficking and sexual assault. 
So to get into this, a little bit about the white paper, the position paper, many different organizations came together and collaborated on this and continue to collaborate on this project. It's an evolving document. And back in 2015, uh, victim advocates and system provider folks got together in a room and said, what are our best practices? Can we promulgate and promote best practices throughout the country? And that's where these papers formed, really in a, a, collaborative, a collaborative way. The purpose of the white papers or these position papers, especially in the area of domestic violence, but ties through with, with my colleagues' discussions as well, is to increase victim safety, offender accountability when appropriate, and community accountability, and to change um, and aggressively prosecute and ethically prosecute domestic violence cases when the evidence supports it. Uh, also, just one moment, please. Um, to promote multidisciplinary approaches. I think that's the key with, with these three areas, HT, sexual assault, and DV, is it takes a village. That is a somewhat cliche, trite phrase at this point in time to some, but I'll tell you, it really does take the entire tribe, the entire village to come together to move the needle in these areas, as many of you know, because you've worked in them for your careers. We have an old saying uh, in the prosecutor world, it takes a good prosecutor to try a murder case, to verdict, you know, to try that case, but it takes a fabulous one, a great one, to actually prevent a murder. And those that do this work for their careers, we're into the business of prevention. Uh, some people think that prosecutors are all just about prosecuting. Uh, we like to think of it as the three Ps. There's prosecution, but also just as important or more important is protection and prevention. And so a lot of these best practices are going to be discussing those other two P's, if you will, of the prosecutor's role, the protection and the prevention. And we can do this. We can, as a collective village, work in the space of protection and prevention, even within a prosecutor's office. And we take great pride in being able to do that and are, are grateful to be able to do that. Domestic violence truly takes a coordinated community response. All the systems working, you know, for instance, on this call, I understand we have advocates and judiciary and defense and, and all the players that come together. It takes a coordinated community response to make this work um, uh, exceptional. One of the best practices of anyone who works in this field is that we must understand the basic premise. The basic premise of, of domestic violence being that it is no longer a private family matter. You know, some may think that you just close the doors and whatever goes on behind those doors, that's, that's their issue, right? That's, that's a family's issue. We can't think that way when it comes to domestic violence. Um, we have to think more globally about it, that it's a, a social and an economic uh, and public health concern. The statistics are there. Um, such a large percentage of women and to extent a smaller percentage, but still significant of men have experienced this psychological aggression by an intimate partner during a lifetime. And there are the stats again for physical violence during a lifetime. Victims will recant, this is part of the presence, the, the premise, victims will recant. They will retract or take back their story. And I'm here to say, we shall not judge them for that. You know, we have to recognize that this is one of the basic cornerstones of the cycle of domestic violence. And some people coming into the field for the first time may say, why? You know, why would a victim who, you know, gets a black eye that's swollen shut come into court and say, you know, I ap accidentally ran into the corner of this table? Why? We must understand the why uh, in working in this field. And really, it's the barriers that you see every day. Um, it's the fear and the shame and the embarrassment. One of the things that uh, is important to understand the premise is that the children are affected, period. Um, it's not that they sleep through domestic violence. They don't, uh, you know, close their ears to it. Sometimes they put their earbuds in and turn their music up. Uh, sometimes they put the pillow over their head, but they don't sleep through domestic violence. They are affected by being caught in the crossfire of domestic violence. And there's plenty of research uh, to support this. There was a Sam Houston study that talked about kids from 78.6% of families can become perpetrators by age 21. Kids from 75% of families become victims uh, by age 21. So in the prevention and the protection world, we don't want to encourage or promote or cause a next generation of batterers or victims, right? So we gotta get in there and intervene 
And that is where the great work that you all are doing comes in and why we must remain vigilant. We must be the experts on the many tips and tools to help reveal what I'll call the ugly truth, to, to borrow a term from a human trafficking campaign about domestic violence. And it really is an ugly truth. Some of the studies that started way back in the 1980s, late 80s, early 90s, Lenore Walker coined this term, the cycle of violence. And there's um, other terms, other philosophies, other theories out there, but I like this one just because it's simple, it's three steps. And there's first a tension building phase. The victim response to this phase is attempts to calm, attempts to appease. You know, if I just do this this way, then he or she won't, you know, do this this way. So it's a, it's a tension building. People, survivors have shared with me, it's like walking on eggshells. It's like not really quite knowing what's gonna happen next, but you know something might. And it's very, very um, tense. And that's why they call it the tension building phase. Then is the phase where there's an actual um, battering episode or an actual acute explosion or some sort of physical violence. Uh, the victim's response to that is protect themselves in any way possible. And then lastly, what has been coined or referred to in some literature as the honeymoon stage or the calming stage. And the victim response to that would be to agree to stay or perhaps return, take the partner back. And again, this is where some people outside the world, i.e. jurors or the general public, they might judge the victim for this. Why would you go back? That's where we have to step in and we have to educate and promote the awareness about the victim. It's not his or her fault. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a response to this cycle of domestic violence. Another best practice that uh, our position paper describes is cultural competence. It is imperative that we working in this field learn our community, not just the general literature about domestic violence victims per se, but also the general communities in which we work, um, the demographics of the communities, who live there, who are the the people that you might not be reaching, that you need to be, the different languages, who are the underserved uh, in your population, and to learn those various barriers. Because it's already the fear and embarrassment and shame of a domestic violence victim generally, but then let's think about the immigrant community. You know, are there extra barriers for them? Uh, the Native American community, are there extra barriers for them? In San Diego, we um, are privileged and, and proud that we have 18 um, Native American Indian tribes in our, our community, the largest in the United States of America. And so we do quite a bit of work um, liaising with our tribal friends and our tribal community. And one woman taught me once, because I didn't quite know how to ask the question, you know, where are you from? Who are, you know, who, what is your tribe? I didn't know. So I just asked her, what's my best way to ask this question? And she said, Tracy, just ask a simple question. Who are your people? Who are your people? And that will generate the dialogue with um, the community of Native Americans. And that was something that, you know, I just needed to ask the question and learn. Um, we have so much to learn in our, in our own communities. What does the person prefer being called? He, she, they. Pron pronouns. Very, very important to just have that cultural competency, competence so that we um, communicate the best and really translate the best for our survivors. In pages 9 to 11 of our position paper, um, it describes some of these, and we'll make sure that you get access to those position papers through Kristen at the end of this uh, seminar. Child witnesses and victims. Um, it's important that we understand ACEs. Many of you who have worked in the field know what that is, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. It was a landmark study, the premier world-renowned landmark study uh, done by someone by the name of Dr. Vincent Folletti way back in 1996, but it's evolved over the, the years as well. And essentially, it's described on page 11 of the paper, but that is really a foundation of where we work in this space. Even just one adverse childhood experience, which can be defined as physical you know, violence, um, sexual violence, or even witnessing domestic violence in the home, um, can have major consequences, health consequences, for the individual throughout a lifetime, even into their 50s and 60s and 70s. And it's important to recognize that so that we look back and say, how are we treating the kids? How are we intervening now uh, to hopefully prevent a next generation of victims? One of our toolbox tips for you is to, in a prosecution or in um, a response to domestic violence, make the children's presence known. Make it known, whether it's reporting it, documenting it, getting them counseling, um, making their presence known is key. 
And here's a short uh, public service announcement about those kids who are present. Where's Where's Derek? Well, I thought he'd be home a couple of hours ago, and what, I what, put everything what, away. What, what, so what's I this? Pizza. What did I have? Pizza. If you had just called me, I would have dinner, been dinner ready. It's a pizza. I didn't know you'd be so late. Oh yeah. It's 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 too much. domestic violence through the eyes of that little three to and a half to four year old, maybe four and a half year old um, child is really um, how we need to approach domestic violence, because that's where the prevention, that's where the protection um, can come in. And some of the toolbox tips that we suggest uh, is, for instance, to train our first responders, you know, take a photograph, report, document the fact that kids were present. Sometimes they can get counseling just as a result of being in a police report. Uh, as a named child victim. We encourage law enforcement and the entire community to consider these a direct victim of child endangerment. We encourage our officers, first responders to charge statutes like child endangerment because the kids are direct victims of that kind of uh, crime. We encourage our communities and our prosecutors or teams to use neurobiology or psychologists as experts to talk about the PTSD and the emotional injury that really is suffered um, by these kids. And this is research-based uh, to try to prove some of these child endangerment um, statutes. I don't know about you, but I'm so tired of little kids witnessing and becoming orphans because dad killed mom or mom killed dad. And uh, it, it's heartbreaking. And so to, to think about those kids and to track those kids and to try to intervene and make sure that they get the services that they need is something that we all can, um, can do. Some other best practices that we want to encourage is what we call vertical case handling. Vertical case handling means that the same person or the same advocate or the same prosecutor handles the case from beginning to end so that that victim is not transferred off or passed off to yet another person that they need to build trust with. Um, so often the, the trust and the control has been taken away from, eradicated, you know, ripped from our domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking victims, and it takes time to build up that trust. So passing them off to all these different people in our offices is not the best thing to do. So to the extent that you can, we get that resources are tight, especially in smaller jurisdictions. Um, to the extent that we can, have that consistent person, that continuity, uh, so that your survivor sees the one person each time they come back to court or on the end of that phone call. We believe that and know that specialized training um, and specialized, you know, verticalized training makes a better domestic violence prosecutor or advocate or person working in this field. And our penal code section, for instance, in California states exactly that, that specialized training and specialized um, folks should be handled these cases that have the training that they need to recognize the barriers and some of the not very intuitive things that might happen with a domestic violence victim like taking back her abuser or his abuser or getting back together or not reporting the abuse. Uh, the most trauma-informed um, training that we can get is the best training we can get. We want all of our prosecutors to be able to recognize that things like offering choice to a domestic violence or sex assault or human trafficking victim is so important. The choice has been taken from them. So offering choice. Would you prefer to be um, you know, contacted via phone, email, or come to the office? A victim might say, wow, I, I, I never get to choose things like this, simple things. And that's why the training is so important. The rapport building is so important. And I encourage people to recruit for this. And the managers and the supervisors on the phone, uh, those that are in positions of assigning out you know, individuals to handle these cases, recruit for it. There are people that are very suited for it, and there are others that might be best handling other cases in the office, and that's okay. But this kind of work does require a special gut and a special um, unique set of skills where someone can approach a victim not with judgment, 
but with open eyes, open ears, open hearts, and the training that we need to make sure that we meet them in that moment the best way that we can. And if you can't do vertical prosecution for the, the lawyers on the line, assign at least at a minimum vertical advocates if we can. Because those advocates, you know, they're those advocates that are on this call, you're expert at this. You're already expert at being trauma informed. And to have that friendly face at the end of the, the line for those victims will go a long way. The next thing I wanted to mention as a best practice is the utilization of experts. This really takes the pressure off of our victim's shoulders. And by this, I mean somebody, an LCSW, um, a psychologist, a domestic violence um, detective, to talk about the general cycle of violence. This takes the pressure off of our victims. Um, there are experts that are uh, been working in the field and had specialized training that can do this and let your jurors know about myths and misperceptions about victims. They're not there to opine on your victim's credibility, saying the victim's telling the truth or not. They're not there to tell the jury you should vote guilty and the crime has been met because the elements have been proven. They are simply there to describe some of the dynamics of domestic violence which um, jurors should be able to know if they're going to find the truth in a particular charge. One of the next best practices that we um, promote in the paper is non-fatal strangulation. Uh, those of us that have worked this field for a long time, um, I've had strangulation murder cases, and that's you know horrible. That's the end, the end of this cycle. And we don't want to get there. We want to back up. But there are so many times where uh, there's a strangulation event, hands around the neck, uh, and the person doesn't die. This is where we need to focus in on. This is where we can truly make a difference. We have learned with medical research that often strangulation cases don't leave visible injuries. Uh, we have learned from our medical doctors that these victims are on, quote, death's door, as it has been described, according to the medical professionals, and they don't even know it. Uh, these are lethal defendants. Some of the research describes that it's associated with an over six times increase in the risk of attempted homicide and seven times increase in the risk of completed homicide has if there has been one non-fatal strangulation incident in the relationship. These are dangerous defendants to our law enforcement uh, professionals as well. We encourage as the solution here to develop protocols, develop policies, think about how you're gonna respond to non-fatal strangulation. And we'll give just a couple ideas that are described in the paper. First, I think educating our community how dangerous these offenders are is um, where we need to start. And there's been um, plenty of research, much more research needs to be done, but they look at officer-involved critical incidences where an officer um, shot a suspect or a suspect shot an officer. And in this particular study, 80% of the suspects had a domestic violence history, a third of them a non-fatal strangulation history. This is based on just public records history alone and it's a small sample size, but this started the, the pathway to many more people looking at this issue. My colleague and friend in Riverside County, Jerry Feynman, looked at eight officers killed in the line of duty where the death is homicide. There was a non-fatal DD strangulation history in half of the people that did the shooting. Again, more research needs to be done. We look at Dallas police quarters, uh, headquarters shooting. This particular defendant in the summer of 2015 uh, went to the Dallas police headquarters, really hunting for cops, is what some of the literature described, uh, arrested for strangling his mother in his past, choked and choked and strangled his uncle, according to court records. Uh, again, these are very, very difficult cases to prove, so that's why we need to look at it differently. The Florida airport shooter, January 2017, arrested prior to that for strangling his girlfriend. Uh, one of the prosecutors who looked at this and described it afterwards said, a successful prosecution requires evidence. And that's one of the trickiest things in these strangulation events is that it often doesn't leave the marks on the neck. So how do we get at it? How do we figure out what happened? A lot of victims don't self-report strangulation. They don't know to report it. They're not asked the question. They think about the gun and the stabbing and the, the lamp that they tried to use to defend themselves, but they don't often think to report strangulation. So we encourage a protocol. One idea is to have all of your touch points who could um, have a hand in a strangulation incident, from dispatchers to first responders, to follow-up investigators, to prosecutors, to simply ask the question, during the incident, did anything go around or against your neck? And then identify based on some science and some research that your medical professionals can help you with. One idea is in your domestic violence police reports, have a screening question. 
did the suspect choke or strangle the victim, yes or no? And if the answer to that is yes, there are many, many examples across the country where a further documentation form is then filled out by the professionals working in this field. Questions such as, you know, did you have vision changes, tunnel vision, raspiness of voice, unable to breathe, these are signs and symptoms that might not be seen by um, the eyes and photographed, but they are what our medical doctors are telling us cause the occlusion to the arteries, to the brain. Uh, an assault to the neck is assault to the brain is, is what, we're, what we're taught when we listen to the medical doctors and read this literature. I encourage you to enlist your community leaders, your district attorney, your police chiefs, your public health professionals to really rally around this cause of let's look at non-fatal strangulation. Some other best practice, and we have copies of all of those protocols in the white paper, and I'm happy to send you those, anything that you need on it. Some other proactive and preventative strategies are to pass the torch to your medical community. They know a ton about uh, the mechanisms that cause the brain um, to really have trauma in a, in a strangulation event. Those medical doctors, those medical professionals um, are persuasive in a way that people who are police or law enforcement or prosecutors cannot be. And so I encourage you to team up with your medical doctors. One county here in our county, our medical doctors ran with this torch of a strangulation protocol. And you know how you hear about measles epidemic or mumps outbreak. They did a health alert network about the effects and the problems of intimate partner violence from a medical perspective in San Diego. I started training the health professionals to do something called um, a screening and an awareness campaign. They did a something called San Diego CARES, which the C stands for conduct screening. The A, assess for signs and symptoms. The R, report the injuries to law enforcement. Uh, the E, evaluate the patient. And the S, obviously safety planning and gave literature and documentation about strangulation to the nurses, public health nurses, ER docs, and uh, anybody who would get in a room in sort of a general rounds type session. We have these posters here to promote the prevention and the awareness about strangulation. I wanna offer these to you in your county. We have it so that we can send it to you. You can put your own logo on it and put these up. Um, it just starts a dialogue about non-fatal strangulation. And some last best practices before I turn it over are high risk teams. These are um, teams that are made of a multidisciplinary group of folks, law enforcement, public health, nursing, um, anybody who could have a, a touch point with a survivor. And they discuss the most serious and high risk kind of um, cases. And sometimes they bring the survivor to the table and discuss a plan, a plan, whether it's get that restraining order, have a relocation, make sure that we have a plan for that victim. And those have um, really had some great successes, and those are described in the paper. We encourage you to pass the torch to your forensic nurses. Forensic nurses are champions when it comes to um, patient outcomes and making sure victims can, can feel safe. We have now domestic assault forensic exams, similar to a SART exam, that can help provide the medical care that the survivor needs. For instance, go to the ER and get that neck checked out. We had one um, particular victim that I can recall that got one of these exams, went to the ER and found out she had a fractured larynx. Um, this is all because we're looking at this a little bit more deeply and asking the question. Our white paper um, is an evolving paper because things and best practices change over time. So I encourage you to email me any of the best practices that you'd like us to feature in this paper, and we will. Um, about every couple of years, we relook at the paper and try to describe some of the um, new and evolving practices. And this is a slide here of some of the later ones that have been um, implemented into the paper. One of them being the discouraging of warrants that compel victims to court. Uh, you know, it, it's not a good day when we are arresting a domestic violence victim because they fail to show up at court. And the paper describes all of the other things that we can do to prevent that from happening. Uh, there's a section in there about the dynamic that sometimes can happen in a jail call. The power and control dynamic can just show itself right there in a jail call so that by the time that the prosecution happens, there is a recantation or a retraction of the statement. And so understanding that, I think, as advocates and as system providers um, can help when we're, we're meeting with those victims. And then lastly, how to reach and serve victims during a pandemic. Um, definitely a best practice. This is the time to be doing proactive check-ins with our victims. 
if every victim advocate contacted 10 a week in your offices and just asked how you're doing, the isolation that's going on right now during a pandemic, we don't even want to think about it because it takes us to a dark space, right? Um, but we can do something about it, and that's reach out. Use the resources that we have to check in with those victims, refer them to resources, and give them as much information as we can, even though many of our courts are not up and running full, full steam, which is very, very secondarily triggering to, to many of the victims. They want that closure. So that is a little bit about um, our paper. And essentially, I'll leave you with a, a call to action here. You know, who are the players that you should be talking to and want to be talking to? Who's not at your table that should be? Who are the leaders and the champions in your community that can have you go back and accomplish one thing um, in the area of protection and prevention this year in your agencies? And we are all in this together. So thank you for the opportunity. And I will turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Adrian Van Eyck. Hello, everybody. I'm Adrienne Van Nuys over in the Boulder District Attorney's Office. And I want to, of course, thank Tracy and Wendy for joining us all the way from uh, California today, although that's certainly easier in this time of COVID when we all just appear by uh, video cam. And Tracy, if you can just throw control over to me. Yes. Thank you, Adrienne. Sorry about that. Oh, no. Okay. Do you have it? I do. Thank you. Okay, all right. So I wanna just start with a video here and then talk to you all a little bit about the Sexual Assault Investigation and Prosecution Best Practices White Paper, which we started um, you know, for much the same reason as the Domestic Violence White Paper. Get some water or tea. It seemed pretty upbeat for uh, you just had their computer stolen. I've just never been robbed before. I'm just trying to be polite. I'm sure it wasn't an unfortunate yard sale. So. Yeah, yeah, it was a brand new iMac with retina display. Ooh, it sounds pretty sexy. Uh, you flaunt it? No, it was right over there on the bureau. Oh, right here in front of this window. Flashing your goods for all the world to see. Kind of sounds like you were asking for it. I should be able to put my computer wherever I want. I found on the point you're going to bring a lot of negative attention to this neighborhood and to yourself. I don't care. It's not my fault that this happened. The perpetrator should be the one getting the negative oh, attention. Whoa. Are you yelling at us? <laughs> because that is exactly the kind of bad behavior that we can use against you in your report. No, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not. Please investigate. Sure. I should go look around. No signs of forced entry. Nope. Box intact. Yep. No broken windows. Do you have any physical evidence that you were robbed? Yes. I had a computer, and now I don't have a computer. Oh, let's not get cute, okay? How do I know that you didn't want someone to take it? Because I'm saying I didn't. Had you been drinking? I had a Bloody Mary at brunch, but I don't see why that matters. <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. Because if you were drinking, the courts are probably going to side with the robber. That doesn't make any sense. Even if I was blackout drunk, I'd still have the right to a safe home. I think we're done here. Wait, wait, what? Well, we need physical evidence in order to prove that you were robbed, and so far, we don't have any. Well, what about those people with fingerprints? What does for fingerprints? Great, yeah, let's do that. But uh, there is a backlog of 400,000 fingerprint kits that have yet to be processed. Oh, wow. It's going to be This is ridiculous. And even if we did find the perp at this point, it would be a real piece of that piece of it. What? Yeah, so uh, you ready to drop this thing? No, absolutely not. Someone was in here without my consent, and they took something that I'll never get back. I feel violated. And by not doing something about it, you're letting them go free so we can do it to other people. We can tell you upset. So uh, we're going to file a report. Don't worry. If I was you, I'd uh, maybe get alarm systems, some security cameras, keep your blinds closed, hide all your valuables. You buy yourself a gun, take some self defense classes, make sure you get a big dog, 
Make sure the house is never alone. No, this whole system is set up against the victim. Hey, robbers will be robbers. Butter will be butter. And here's where I always get into trouble trying to move through this. So, you know, you watch the video and of course the video is a little bit humorous, but at the same time, the video that we just watched really highlights a lot of the issues and difficulties and struggles that we have with respect to the investigation and prosecution and presentation of sexual assault cases. And obviously really highlights a lot of the struggles that our victims and survivors have with respect to these particular uh, types of investigations and their outcries related to them. So it's sort of with all of that in mind that we came together um, and started to put together the white paper, which is also a living document, just like the domestic violence white paper. And again, I invite, as Tracy did, anybody who's watching today, uh, who has suggestions for materials that should be in the white paper, to send those to me so we can make sure that we're keeping it up to date and it's evolving as our best practices evolve. So what is the solution, right? What is the solution to some of these problems that have been highlighted by this video? And some of those solutions are that we really need to make sure that we're approaching these cases in a trauma-informed way. And that is across the board. That's our prosecutors. That's our investigating officers. That's our victim advocates. Um, we need to make sure that we're doing offender-focused investigations. And I know that we have a number of individuals on here who are victim advocates, and you may say to yourself, you know, how do I help do an offender-focused investigation? And there are a number of things that you can do um, in terms of encouraging the use of the best practices through um, your local law enforcement agencies and your prosecutor's offices. The use of multidisciplinary teams um, in terms of the evaluation of these cases and assisting in the presentation of these cases, the use of dedicated specialized prosecutors, of course, and then fearless, dedicated, thoughtful, strategic prosecutions. These are the cases where you really have to bring your A game every single time. So when I talk about a multidisciplinary approach, there are a couple of different models and you can use either one or both. In Boulder County, we use both. And the first model uh, is the multidisciplinary team, often referred to as a SART or a SARC, S-A-R-K, um, or a sexual assault response team. And present on this multidisciplinary team are representatives from here in Colorado. It would be CBI um, or your local forensic labs, um, medical professionals, your sexual assault nurse examiners, uh, law enforcement, police, uh, district attorneys, ancillary service providers like mental health, Department of Health and Human Services, as well as both our community as well as our law enforcement based advocacy units. This particular team is a team that depending on the needs of your jurisdiction is typically going to meet quarterly, perhaps more often, perhaps less often, but it's really going to dig deep and say, what are we doing with respect to taking care of our survivors of sexual assault, whether it's investigation, whether it's prosecution, whether it's the provision of um, community supports, whether it's the provision of appropriate medical care, what are we doing and what can we do better? And how can we communicate as a group of multidisciplinary professionals to make sure that we're maintaining a standard of best practice in our community, developing protocol for the use of sexual assault nurse examiners, developing a protocol for your investigation. Are there checklists that we can use that perhaps folks can bring to the table in terms of these investigations? Anything and everything that we can think of from each of those different disciplines that we can talk about and figure out how to really do a good job of providing service to our survivors, making sure that we're um, seeking justice in those cases and, and that uh, in the appropriate cases that convictions are obtained. The other model is a case staffing model. In um, Boulder County, we call this our SART model, our multidisciplinary 
um, policy team is our SARC model. And what you can do, what we do is, for example, every Wednesday in our jurisdiction, any detective who has an investigation that they believe is either ready for charging um, or is at the end of its investigative life, there's not much more we can do, we need to make a decision on this case, or perhaps they're stuck on a case and they need ideas. They come to the table. We have a large, again, multidisciplinary meeting that involves prosecutors, that involves the detectives who are presenting that day. It involves representatives from our Child Advocacy Center, our Child Forensic Interviewers. It involves, um, when appropriate, DHHS, mental health, um, as well as our community-based advocates. And our law enforcement officers present the case to the team and issues with the case are discussed. Um, are there concerns from the prosecution or the law enforcement with respect to uh, the ability or the, or the um, ability of the victim to, uh, to go forward with respect to a trial? Are there concerns surrounding the outcry? Are there concerns surrounding some of the victim behaviors that are being um, exhibited in that case? And it gives the multidisciplinary team an opportunity to really educate law enforcement as well as the prosecutors with respect to what may or may not be um, a, um, I don't wanna say valid, but what may or may not fit within the research um, in the realm of, of, of relevant behaviors. It also gives those um, community-based folks an opportunity to know this case might be coming down the pike. And what we do at the end of the meeting or at the end of the presentation is we let the officer know, hey, this case is ready, we're gonna charge it, we're gonna move forward on it. Or this case is not ready, here are some additional steps we'd like you to take in terms of this investigation as informed by the multidisciplinary discussion. Or, you know what, this case is not ever going anywhere um, based on the, the status of the investigation right now. There's not anything else that you can do based on the status of the investigation right now. If anything comes up, let us know, you can always represent. Um, but right now, uh, this is not a case that's gonna move forward. And so we're able to really build the cases from the ground up, rather than just have a file land on your desk that all of a sudden you have to charge. And it's really useful from a prosecutorial standpoint because the cases are in the best possible shape that they can be in general. Sometimes you have those emergency arrests that need to be made. But in general, your cases are in the best position that they can possibly be before you file charges, which really allows you to do your job with respect to discovery and getting that information out to the defense. And it also gives you the opportunity to move those cases along without unnecessary delays and to make sure that whatever you're presenting to the jury is the best possible presentation in any particular case. We also advocate through the best practices um, white paper that you really be cognizant as advocates, as prosecutors, as investigators, that you really be cognizant of the effect of trauma and its impacts on your case, right? If you have a, a victim or a survivor who says to you, who says to law enforcement officers, I couldn't move, I must have been drugged, you can talk to that particular um, victim about the impact of trauma on the body, of course, but you can also factor that into your investigation, right? Now you have a victim who's going to testify, I think I was drugged. How do you explain that to the jury if you happen to have a first urine sample um, that doesn't indicate the presence of a drug or an intoxicant? You need to make sure that you understand how trauma impacts the body, how the freeze response works, so that you can bring in the experts who can explain that to your jury. You also need to be able to understand that as an advocate, as a prosecutor, as an investigator, so that you can help the uh, officers who are investigating that case understand that this isn't a situation where your victim is saying something that's not credible or untrue, but in fact is simply um, trying to make sense of her body's physical response in that particular moment. 
what we know also is that people who experience trauma are not the greatest witnesses. And it's important that we understand the effects of trauma on an individual one so we can use some experts to help explain some of those things to our jurors but also so that we can understand what it is that we're seeing what it is that we're interacting with and we can use that information to help us with those critical credibility um, decisions that we have to make we need to remember that individuals who have suffered a trauma are 15 times more likely to commit suicide are three times more likely to have serious job problems, to be job hoppers, to constantly be unemployed and reemployed and unemployed, three times more likely to experience depression, um, four times more likely to inject drugs as well as to become an alcoholic, right? These are a lot of the signs and symptoms that we see with the individuals that we're working with on these cases. And we need to understand um, in order to provide better service and do a better job, um, that, that trauma really is impacting this individual as a whole, systematically, beyond just the one puzzle piece that's the, the assault in the case. We also need to understand how trauma impacts memory and recall. We need to understand that because of the way that experiencing a trauma impacts how our brain works, at the time that we're experiencing it, it creates a situation in which it can be very difficult for the survivor to recall the details of the event or to recall the details of the event in a way that is um, consecutive um, or coherent. It may be jumbled. We may have facts that are disclosed at different times, which can make it seem as if your survivor lacks credibility or seem as if your survivor is making it up when in fact this is just her um, natural process of memory. We have to know that it, uh, trauma can lead to inconsistent, inaccurate, and even untrue recall. And when we're thinking about that, we can think about officers who are involved in it, for example, an officer involved shooting who are interviewed immediately after the incident um, who have already handed their gun over to investigative officers and might say, oh, I fired three shots, but their magazine is empty. Now, this is someone who knows that we're going to count every bullet. Um, and so to tell a, a story that I, I only fired three shots, they know is not going to be believed. In general, this is not someone who is lying. This is someone who legitimately only believes firing those three shots. And we need to take those lessons that we have from that and apply those to our survivors and our victims of traumatic events. We also should really think about when we're thinking about um, how we're dealing with our victims and our survivors on scene, consider adapting as a best practice those same tools that we use in officer-involved shootings to protect the integrity of the interviews that we're obtaining in those cases, as well as to extend some protections to those particular officers as they go through a traumatic moment in time. Think about, can we adapt some of those procedures that we use in our jurisdictions already to, to move towards um, or to put into place with our victims and survivors of traumatic events. And that's not just sexual assault, right? That's domestic violence. That's a really terrible car accident. That's a horrible assault, um, stranger assault. Think about, can we reassure this individual? Can we tell this person, I'm sorry this happened to you? How are you, right? Um, I believe you. Can we, can we communicate, we believe you? Can we give to a victim of sexual assault as we walk in the door? The same credibility that we get, give to a victim of a robbery, that we give to somebody who calls in and says, my car's just been trespassed. We don't arrive on scene in those cases anticipating that those individuals have lied to us. Can we give our sexual assault survivors and victims that same uh, credibility that we give to other victims of other crime. Make sure that we're providing mental health care, that we're providing medical care. Whether or not your victim was physically injured during the sexual assault, she may have other medical needs that need to be taken care of, evaluation for potential pregnancy, evaluation 
for potential um, sexually transmitted infection. There's lots of other things that our SANE nurses are doing. Make sure that we're being respectful with our evidence collection, trying to do it in a private way. Moving these individuals on a hot sex assault report from the scene as quickly as possible so we can take them out of a triggering environment, validate their normal stress reactions, and provide support. You think about what we can take from what we already do for our teammates, for our law enforcement officers, and extend those same courtesies to our victims and our survivors. Also, we should be talking about our interview techniques. What are we doing in terms of when we're interviewing our victims and survivors? Let's make sure as a best practice that we're recording these interviews. And when we record these interviews, what that does is that creates a situation in which one, our victim hopefully doesn't have to tell this story over and over and over again, but also it prevents situations in which a communication misunderstanding or a misinterpretation of what the victim is communicating to an officer becomes an inconsistency because the officer reports the victim as communicating a particular fact when in fact that's not what the victim was communicating. And if we had the actual words in a recording, um, we would be able to see that that was really just a situation where an officer interpreted language um, in a way that was inconsistent with the message that was actually being communicated. We encourage our officers, we encourage our um, prosecutors to consider utilizing a FETI type interviewing approach. FETI, if, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a forensic experiential trauma informed interviewing. And it's really modeled in a lot of ways on um, a child forensic interview where you're ha starting at the very top of the funnel, right, with very broad, open ended. Um, narrative-based questions and then narrowing that funnel down to get to the nitty-gritty facts of a particular segment or a particular moment in the assault and then opening that funnel back out, going back to a narrative um, response and then again as you need to bringing it back in and continuing that over and over as you move through the process, asking questions like what did you think, what did you smell, what did you hear, what could you feel, what could you taste, all of those things. We really encourage, as part of the best practice, collaboration. And you've seen that already in this presentation where I've talked a lot about the use of multidisciplinary teams. But also, I want to make sure that we're collaborating as more of a ground zero, right? Both community-based as well as law enforcement-based um, advocates, there are ways that you can work with law enforcement in a particular case, those of you with privilege, um, in a way that preserves and protects that privilege, um, but that really is designed to move the ball forward and advance the best interests of the victim or survivor. And making sure that we're working together as a team instead of working in our individual silos. Making sure that we are using sexual assault nurse examinations, that's certainly a best practice or sexual assault forensic examinations, depending on what you have in your particular jurisdiction, right? As I talked about previously, these have a dual purpose. They're beneficial, obviously, to law enforcement because that helps us to collect any physical evidence and document any physical evidence that may exist in the case. But it also is extremely beneficial to your victim in a lot of different ways that I've already talked about. Additionally, think about when you have a case where you don't have physical injury, um, certainly that is a, a defense in those particular cases. That's an argument that the defense makes. There's no injury. How can this be a sexual assault? Lean on your safe or sane examiner to help you explain the female anatomy. It's a part of the body that's meant to stretch. This is what it does to explain why you may or may not have um, injury, whether that's vaginal injury or anal injury or either, um, lean on those folks and develop those relationships so that you can have that expert testimony. And also, if you have a question, if you're not sure, what does this mean? You can reach out to those folks in your community and in your, in your uh, area and say, okay, here's my situation. Help me understand what it is that I'm, what I'm seeing here. 
And then I cannot stress, of course, the importance of a safe or sane investigation in a non-investigative reporting option. And so that rolls into another best practice that we really want to encourage folks to explore in their jurisdictions, which is the use of an option-based reporting system where victims have the right or the ability to either do a traditional law enforcement report, I'm coming to you, I'm out crying to you law enforcement, I want there to be an investigation, or I just want to have a sane examination where evidence is collected, but I don't necessarily want um, there to be a law enforcement investigation in this particular case. I want you to maintain the evidence, but I'm not sure that I want to go forward at this point, and I'd like to have the option of making that decision down the road. And there are a number of different programs, like the You Have Options program that you can utilize um, in your particular jurisdiction. But what we know is that non-investigative reporting actually ultimately increases the number of good reports that we have down the road. Um, the Department of Defense actually pioneered the graduated reporting uh, system. And in 2005, the first year of the graduating reporting system, 108 of the 435 victims who initially used the confidential reporting mechanism later chose to convert um, those to a law enforcement investigation and file a formal complaint. Um, and that has been replicated in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where they saw 22%, again, about a quarter, of um, those types of reports, the non-investigative reporting option, develop into a formal investigation. A lot of people are nervous about the concept of um, the non-investigative report, but if you think about it, the vast majority of cases that we prosecuted, uh, that we prosecute and investigate are delayed reports in some way, shape, or form, right? Would you, as an investigator, as a prosecutor, rather have a delayed report with no physical evidence or a delayed report with physical evidence. I think you'd much rather have that delayed report with that physical evidence and with that more immediate outcry to a medical personnel as opposed to um, a delayed outcry down the road. So I think although it's, it's new and different and so it makes us nervous, this is actually a good thing because it allows us to build better cases in a way that's trauma-informed and sensitive to our survivors' needs. Vertical prosecution with sexual assault, just the same as with domestic violence. It's really critical to make sure that your victims don't feel like they're a hot potato, right? Um, make sure that as a, as a best practice that you're taking care of your victim, right? That you're meeting with them pre-charging if you can. Um, and remember, that's not an interrogation. We're not going to talk about the case. We're going to build some rapport. We're going to make sure that we keep them informed throughout the process, and we're going to let ourselves care. And I have some asterisks here, right, because we have to be conscious of the impact of what we do on ourselves. We have to be conscious of the impacts of secondary and vicarious trauma on our ability to be good and functioning adults and humans, but we can still protect ourselves while allowing ourselves to care about our survivors, and that's what I really want us to do. We encourage you to consider the use of therapy animals, support animals in your offices, in your courtrooms, um, and encourage your victims to seek out people who can provide support to them, whether that's an advocate or a family member or a friend. Encourage them to build a team so that when they're faced with this prosecution, they have a support system to lean on. We encourage the use of specialized units or that. Uh, prosecutors who are investigating, prosecuting these cases become specialists, and then investigators who are investigating these cases become um, specialists. Get an education on these issues. Get out there. Read the research. Go to trainings. Understand all of these factors that come into play so that you can do a better job. Bond reform obviously is a big issue right now in terms of um, protecting our victims, protecting the community, as well as making sure that we're respecting the rights and that we're not just incarcerating folks who can't afford to get out, right? Um, but the basic tenet is that we should always be considering community and victim safety and encouraging the court to impose conditions that are most likely to avoid reoffense and to ensure community safety, right? We want to make sure we're asking for no contact orders. 
Um, but what do those no contact orders look like? Is it just no contact with the victim? Should we be considering no contact with a class of persons, for example, anyone under the age of 18? What about a class of persons that are not consistent with the victim's class, right? You have a child or maybe you have an adult victim, but you are wanting a no contact order that includes no contact with anyone under the age of 18. What about no contact with the offender's own children, right? Um, it's really important as we're thinking about those things and what we're gonna ask the court, of course, that we have challenges with respect to the federal case law, um, Burns, and as well as a, a whole body of other case law that talks about basically that the court needs to make specific findings that there is a risk to these other people, that there is a risk to the defendant's children who are not the victim or survivor of the attack before the court can impose those conditions. And in responding to those arguments and in making those requests, I encourage you to take a look at the research out there. This research that I put up here, you'll actually find in our Sex Offender Management Board guidelines. I believe it used to be Appendix D. I think now it might be Appendix E. Um, but take a look at this research from, from Heil. This is based on Colorado DOC offenders. These are our local offenders. And we know um, that offenders cross offend. We know that they offend across a broad spectrum of genders, across a broad spectrum of ages. Um, and we also know that uh, offenders will offend even when other adults are present. So when we're talking about supervised contact, um, you can cite to the uh, to the Capaletti and Underwood um, research from 1999 that I've got here on the board that talks about how often offenders will offend even with another non-collaborating adult present in the room or even in the same bed. Um, and at the end of the day, you just have to be aggressive with these cases. These cases are scary. These cases are hard. Um, defense attorneys bring their A game every single time on these cases, and you absolutely should too. Um, make sure that you're paying attention to hearsay, that you're doing motions to preclude self-serving hearsay, that you're paying attention to 404, that you're working to admit 404B when appropriate, um, that you're using experts, that you're encouraging an offender focused. What did he do? Who is he? Um, what steps did he take uh, investigation? And also presenting to the jury who this victim is now is different from who she was before um, to sort of combat that buyer's remorse uh, defense. And be aware of some of the defense stumbling blocks, right? Of course, consent is always an issue in these cases. How do we combat a consent defense? How are we dealing with the concept of false report? Make sure you're educating yourself. And there's some great sections in the white paper that talk about some of the research around false reporting um, and the realities, which is that it is no greater um, statistically, um, sexual assault is not more often false reported than any other offense. Um, be familiar with the research around suggestibility. There's great research out there from uh, Dr. Goodman with respect to that. Make sure that you're aware of all of the changes in DNA technology and how now our DNA technology is so sensitive that it can create some issues for us with respect to alternate suspects um, that we didn't have before. Um, and alcohol, right? Make sure you understand alcohol and the fact that when we have rape myths, right, we tend to think, well, alcohol made him rapey, right? If he wasn't drinking, he wouldn't have done this. But there's some great research out there that talks about that individuals who thought they were drinking alcohol were more sexually aroused by depictions of forcible rape than college men who didn't think they had um, consumed alcohol. And the authors of that study posited that perpetrators may use alcohol as a justification of behavior they recognize as a deviant. And additionally, as we know, alcohol is always used as not always, but typically and often used as a weapon. Make sure you're working to combat rape myth exception throughout the presentation of your case, but also through uh, your jury selection in these particular cases and that you're dealing with concepts around victim blaming and understand why we victim blame and figuring out ways um, to combat that. Your you know, jury selection really is where it's at. And so we have some suggestions in the white paper around what you can do 
um, on that particular issue. And then at the end of the day, right, the best practice is that you just work these cases. Again, respecting your limits, respecting um, your body, respecting your own mental health needs, but work these cases, work them as hard as you possibly can. And so with that, I'm going to turn this over to Wendy, who's going to talk to you about human trafficking. Oh, hang on. There we go. Nice. Minutes. Okay, I think we're in business. Excellent. Well, thank you all so much again for joining us. You know, best practices, that's become almost a buzzword. We share best practices. I don't think any of us are would ever come together claiming to have the best practices. We have practices that work for us and practices that we'd like to share with you. And that's a two-way street. These programs only get better as do the white papers that anchor them, which are living documents, as Adrian and Tracy have said, that only get better by your collaboration and, and really the brainstorming we do oftentimes after these calls. So feel free to, to continue that tradition. So human trafficking is an enormous problem and has only become more complicated after pandemic lockdowns. It was hard enough sometimes to detect it as it was. It's even more challenging when we don't have the kind of public exposure to some of the red flags that we had before. But just to start with a couple of really stunning statistics that I hate to say uh, become more disheartening every year in some sense, and that has to do with the numbers. It is one of the most profitable criminal enterprises in the world. And these numbers, I mean, when you talk about an estimated $32 billion industry, that was back in 2012. What's happened since then? it has even become more profitable because it is even more moving online. And that's especially because of the COVID restrictions over the course of the last year, that there are even more cases and those numbers are even higher today. It's a worldwide problem. We've talked about this all over the world. Um, I, as a San Diego deputy district attorney for 23 years, gulp, please nobody do the math, but a number of those years have been spent prosecuting human trafficking related cases and it's knowledge is power, that's true, um, but it is very disheartening to see the trajectory of how easy this is, especially given the digital world in which we live. So uh, as my colleague Tracy Pryor began this program with, so I will continue. Uh, sure, it's about prosecution, but a great prosecutor prevents crime. And by working together uh, with all the different roles that we play in this system, we can work together as a community of prosecutors, of uh, criminal defense attorneys, of judges, of victim advocates, investigators, medical professionals, and everybody in between. So the scope of the problem of human trafficking, we always recognize that it is modern day slavery. We recognize that it's different than the drug trade, for example, because unlike narcotics, which can be consumed, unfortunately, human trafficking victims, and until we turn them into survivors, let's say, are continually to being used. I have tried cases and put victims on the stand where they have talked about how many quote unquote dates they are able to provide in a day. And it is heartbreaking for everybody in the courtroom, including the jurors to hear this. But that is one of the reasons why sadly it's as profitable as it is. If I had two more hours, I would go into the demand side as well and talk about how that remains one of the biggest challenges is it would be great if we could figure out also how to reduce demand. But we do recognize collectively that human trafficking remains one of the biggest human rights violations of our time. Just a little bit of, in terms of background about the laws that we have, all 50 states now have these laws, many of which are based very closely on federal anti-trafficking laws. And we look at the same three Ps that, uh, that Tracy Pryor talked about. We talk about prosecution, yes, but also prevention and protection. And under US federal law, 
that again, many of our states follow some version of these kinds of laws. The definitions are also very similar. Sex trafficking is described as, and look at how broadly it's described. Recruitment, very important, I'll talk about that in a minute. Harboring, transportation, provision, obtaining, patronizing, and it goes on for purposes of, and then it talks about the, the necessity of a commercial sex act. Now, why is that so important? Why is that definition so expansive? And how does that help us to know exactly what's included? Sometimes the recruitment is the easiest to pinpoint because that actually involves befriending, luring, seducing, either by the trafficker or by an agent of the trafficker, as we often see. Sometimes we're able to detect that and hopefully prevent it right from the outset. It's also important to know that federally, this definition of a commercial sex act is any sex act on which anything of value is given. So you don't necessarily always look for the cash. It can be anything of value. Uh, and that's important to know because we all know that there are plenty of different types of ways in which value is exchanged in the world in which we live other than uh, just simply talking about cash. And it is very important also to know how labor trafficking is defined. And look at how similar the definition is. It talks about many of the same things. It talks about recruitment, harboring, transportation. Remember that although labor trafficking is very different than smuggling, we do see some areas of desperation that have been identified during the pandemic, where originally you see people honestly wanting to work honestly wanting to make a living for their family because they've lost their jobs. They've either been fired or furloughed and they see an opportunity not recognizing that it is actually human trafficking, just thinking, well, gosh, it's unfair labor. And that is the way they get roped in to illegal labor trafficking. Now, if I were teaching this live, I'd probably take this opportunity to ask for a show of hands as to whether people think that sex trafficking or labor trafficking is more prevalent. And I guarantee you, most people would be in one of the two camps. But then I would follow that up with asking, well, how do you know? And why do you think that? And especially given what we've seen during the pandemic, many of you would acknowledge that it is very hard to detect labor trafficking, especially when we are not seeing the kinds of restaurant inspections that normally take place and sometimes was able to see some of the signs of labor trafficking, somebody that doesn't have any identification who never leaves the building, who seems to work extraordinary hours. Some of the red flags that we know, given what we know about these crimes, but that the public wouldn't necessarily be aware of if the restaurants aren't even open for us to be able to see these things to begin with. And then, of course, we also talk about some of the campaigns, some of the great campaigns that our different jurisdictions have done, both individually and in partnership with one another. And part of that has to do with this campaign of public awareness. You know, almost inevitably, and I know some of you relate to this as well, if you've taken part in whether it's domestic violence or whether it's um, child abuse, elder abuse, financial abuse, whatever it is, sometimes afterwards members of the public approach us and say, how can we help? And that is exactly why we have these public awareness campaigns is because there are ways that the public can help. But one of the ways when we're talking about human trafficking is recognizing that this is really, as with domestic violence and some of the other cases we're talking about, especially sexual assault also, the other pandemics, the invisible pandemics, but not so invisible once we educate the public as to what they really look like, where to look, and what to do with the information they see. So this is an example of one of those billboards that reminds people that there is no such thing as a teenage prostitute, doesn't exist, that's called child slavery. And that's what we have to start with and recognizing how some of these crimes get started and how we can do a better job of realizing that, yes, it's in our backyards. I can't tell you how many programs I've given in upscale areas in different jurisdictions where I've asked the same question, how many of you believe that there's human trafficking going on in your community? And Believe it or not, this is probably a very savvy crowd, so you no doubt already know this, but some community members honestly believe they don't have a trafficking problem in their neighborhood. And when you ask them why, they say, well, everybody knows the police chief. We're a tight-knit community. 
look around you. This is a wealthy area. It's affluent. Well, then why wouldn't that be a perfect hiding place to get trafficking activity, uh, non out in the open, but the kind of covert operations that make it even harder for law enforcement or the rest of the community members to detect. Now, I query how many times I would hear that after the Jeffrey Epstein debacle and after all of that came to light, where actually, yes, it is in prosperous neighborhoods where this takes place. It takes place everywhere. But this was one of the big myths that was causing this crime not to be reported or detected as often as it should have been. This was another one. Now, it is true, for those of you that have seen the movie Taken, very powerful series of movies, it is true that sometimes it does happen this way, where you do see young women snatched off a street corner by men in a van with no windows, but that's not normally what we see in terms of the cases that come to us for prosecution. It's oftentimes the old adage, as many traffickers have admitted, that you can catch more with honey than with vinegar. That is how they're able to attract the victims that they have. They lure them in by promises of a better life, of being a good boyfriend, of gifts, of fancy cars, of all of the different types of things and trappings of a glamorous subculture that sometimes these young women have never had, have never seen. And it can be very alluring to be in that kind of a relationship. That is one of the, the primary myths is that we as community members have to be aware that those couples parading their relationships out in public may not be as consensual as you think. Sometimes that's where we learn to look for some of those micro expressions and signs of manipulation, coercion, and sometimes fear. Many of these victims are not bound with physical change. We've all seen the late night documentaries of human trafficking. And again, those cases do exist and it's heartbreaking. But the other cases exist as well, where it's emotional chains that bind the victims. And those emotional change, they are more powerful than physical chains because those victims won't run, even if they have an opportunity, because that is the kind of bond that they formed oftentimes with their trafficker. And those of us that have tried these cases in court or in the case of victim advocates or medical professionals, you no doubt have had contact with some of these victims. And as we try to, to transition them into becoming a survivor, sometimes these are the kinds of relational dynamics that are uncovered. In fact, in that respect, human trafficking victims are often far more common than, uh, let's say, domestic violence victims in terms of the kinds of emotions they have towards their traffickers. They have more in common with domestic violence victims than perhaps they do with sexual assault victims. Positive affirmation is something that traffickers often use to control their victims and keep them in this harmful relationship cycle. This is just some screenshots from one of the cases I handled, where you see the trafficker or the pimp uh, really building up this victim to believe that this is something great and that it's a, it's a wonderful life that he's given her, not to, notwithstanding the fact that she then turns over all her money. But these are the kinds of relational dynamics that we see in real time when you look at the text messages. In fact, digital evidence is one of the primary ways in which we prove the true nature of the relationship between the victim and the trafficker. This is just one of many examples. Uh, the next myth I wanna talk about is the glamor myth. Again, this does us no favors for these young women that are lured into this, this situation believing that it's gonna be some kind of a glamorous life. Now, I already told you how many years I've been a prosecutor. And what I didn't tell you is I was a criminal defense attorney before then, so you'd even add more years to my age, I hate to say it, but just to give myself a little bit of credibility, I remember when the movie Pretty Woman came out in the movie theaters, remember those? And it wasn't about prostitution, quote unquote, it was a love story. And sadly, that only perpetrates the myth that is responsible for some of these young women agreeing to become involved in these types of illicit relationships. Uh, it's a terrible dynamic of love and loyalty from the victim's perspective, notwithstanding the reality of what they have to do to earn this love, to earn the money, and sometimes to earn even staying in this relationship. Now, you might think, oh, that's good and well, we really don't see this type of thing anymore. Well, yes, we do. Um, I go on a lot of cruise ships, or at least I did pre-COVID and hope to do it again. We cruise several times a year. We love the food. We love the buffets. 
But I always take my camera to take some real life photographs for these programs, especially on human trafficking, because you would have thought this bling king video machine was something maybe what, from like the 1980s? Nope, didn't take this photo too many years ago. You can even see me in my reflection in the middle of it. This is not helpful for young people who we are trying to maintain an aura of credibility when we explain there is nothing sexy about this glamorous subculture of pimping and pandering that you see in the movies, that you see on TV specials. Sadly, you still see it when we go out in public and still see remnants like this that are glamorizing this kind of a life. Now, how else do we know that it exists? Because many of us work with these victims and talk to them about, well, how in the world did you agree to have a relationship with somebody that ended up just trafficking you? And oftentimes they talk about Vegas trips, rides and limousines, the kinds of things that they explain they've never had before. This is a, one of those myths that this is going to be some kind of a glamorous life that they're going to get involved in, they're gonna to get to keep some of the money, but this is the luring side of it, the luring lie, as we often say, that we have to use with our victims to explain to them what, they, what they're really involved in and then how we can help. Because oftentimes our victims are not 100% cooperative, if anywhere even close to that, with us as law enforcement. Now, it's also helpful as we talk about working through this epidemic as a community to know where the high intensity prostitution areas are. So when I show you this list, it's probably no surprise that you see areas like Los Angeles, Las Vegas, Dallas, uh, Miami. That's probably not a surprise that those would be high intensity child prostitution areas. But many people looking at this list are surprised at some of the cities that made the list. St. Louis, Minneapolis. Detroit, um, Tampa. I mean, some of these you wouldn't automatically associate with high intensity child prostitution, yet there they are. And then you also think about the trafficking hotspots, uh, things like the Super Bowl, conferences. Why demand? Because these traffickers that have taken, their, they've taken this online, especially over the course of the last 10 months, know that there's a buying market that's going to be attending these events. Uh, Super Bowl is a notorious trafficking hotspot. Conferences are as well, especially when the conference is held in one of those high intensity cities. So that's almost a double whammy. You've got a some sort of a tech conference or Super Bowl um, memorabilia conference, the kinds of things that attract lots of people also being held in one of those major conference cities. So we look at the convention cities as hotspots also. Hunting grounds, you know, I like to say you'll never look at a mall food court again once, uh, if you ever heard my long extended program on human trafficking and recruiting areas, because you see these guys, they are dressed like they're going to a nightclub and they are hanging around a shopping mall food court, not eyeing the selection of pizza, but eyeing the selection of prey. They will be there looking for those tweens, those in-betweens, the young girls that are too old to be continually supervised, but too young to drive. That is their target age, many of them, and they're not looking for the prettiest or the most popular. They're looking for the young girls that are not used to getting the kinds of attention that they're going to bestow on them. That is a recruiting methodology that unfortunately they've been successful with in the past. So obviously we talk about the myths. You're not going to see traffickers driving these, these, you know, wearing fedoras and driving these Cadillacs with a big chandeliers hanging on the front of them. That is a myth. If that's what we're looking for, we're going to miss the other subtle red flags that are right under our eyes. We also are not necessarily going to recognize victims unless we take into consideration that victims can be anyone. I've had victims ranging from young girls that were homeless to girls that were going to college. There isn't any necessary demographic background, economic strata that would make somebody more likely to be a victim, except to the extent to which it would make them vulnerable. So somebody that needs money, needs a place to stay, that's always going to be true. And by the way, that's true for many different types of crimes, including, as my colleagues have talked about, sexual assault and domestic violence as well. But sometimes the labor trafficking victims are the ones that have been serving you drinks at a local cafe, have been bringing you your soda, maybe for years. Maybe you never noticed they never left the building. 
or seem to always be working, which means that they're working already in, in, in violation of labor laws. Just a couple of red flags I sometimes mention when I teach this to parents. You know, how many cell phones does a 13-year-old girl need? Now, I know many parents say none, zero. However, there are still some parents that do want to be able to keep track of their daughters. But if young women have more than one cell phone, we have to ask the question, why? Some of these are obvious as well. I mean, your daughter your, or the neighbor's daughter is carrying a Gucci bag. Where did that come from? Especially if you know the parents would never have bought an extravagant pur purchase like that. So too with the other clothing, the lingo, the friends. You know, if we're not paying the kind of attention to the young people in our community as we could be, these things are gonna continue to fly under the radar. Where otherwise, they may be pretty stunning if we take the time to notice. Now, here are some other photos from my cases. You know, the tattoos, the kinds of things that really shock jurors. That's the reason we use expert witnesses is to explain why a victim would agree to have a trafficker's tat name tattooed on her back or her uh, or other places that sadly we end up finding these tattoos as well. Um, but we have to know how to recognize these victims and really dispel some of the myths of it being only the, the vulnerable. Because we're gonna leave some time for questions at the end. Let me just um, skip, if I could, to just a, a, a combat plan for us collectively. Tracy gave you three Ps. I'll expand it briefly to four Ps. Prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnerships. What we're doing on this call, sharing best practices, reaching out to you to help us make these living documents better and making all of our best practices better. Uh, some of our combat strategies. Uh, each one of our communities has different blueprints where we have advisory councils and we look to see how we can work together in our communities. We talk about vertical prosecution, something that is important in domestic violence and sexual assaults as well, a consistent team that goes with the victim through her court appearances, through trying to find a place to live, making her, helping her into a survivor rather than simply being a victim. So we look through all of this collectively and individually. What can we do? I'm often asked that. Well, we support legislation. We encourage our local schools to pursue this type of education. We try to bring this into our faith-based organizations. And then of course we support our victims every way we can throughout the life of the case and beyond to help them make that transition to becoming a survivor. And I always love this quote, and it, it works almost for any kind of program that we give when it comes to really doing what we can to protect our community and help our victims. And that is the only thing necessary to let evil win, I'm paraphrasing, is for us to do nothing. So that is our building culture of best practices. I'm gonna turn it back over to our gracious host to see if maybe we don't have any questions. Yes, we do. This is Kirsten. Tracy, Adrian, and Wendy, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, we have several uh, questions and we're real close to time, so we'll do as many as we can. If you're not able to stick around, please do download the handout that they've provided for you and the handouts box there, um, as well as note the eval link um, in the chat. So with that, let's start. Um, one of the barriers we face is homelessness among victims. Do you have any recommendations on how to reach this population? I can take that one. Um, one innovation that we saw was a community got a grant to place an advocate at the homeless shelters, the local homeless shelters. And I really liked that idea. The goal of that was to have the advocate just really put a chair up and start to build trust. What we learned from the homeless survivors is that you don't just walk up to somebody because there's a sign up that says, have you been a victim? It has to be a trust built over time. And so the advocates told us that once they were there for about three weeks, people did start coming and talking to them. The goal was that if they took a survey and identified as a survivor of abuse, the advocate can then connect them into um, resources. So maybe teaming up with your local homeless shelters and uh, consider co-locating an advocate there uh, is one idea. Awesome, thank you. Uh, someone else wants to know if you're able to provide the video link to the PSA that Tracy uh, was playing during your part of the presentation? Absolutely. Or if it was, got it on YouTube, okay. I'll provide that to Kristen, absolutely. Excellent. Um, can you recommend any good trauma-informed trainings available that you all like? 
Well, I am a member of um, and Violence Against Women International, the cadre, and they have a very extensive library of resources um, that include um, some of that information. And I know all of the prosecutor, the, the national agencies do as well. So does IVAT. Um, and Tracy and, and Adrian, no doubt have some more, but I want, I know that Evalwi's library is vast and it's constantly being updated. <laughs> And the great thing about that is that's online. Oftentimes you can find that you can watch it anytime. Um, you, NDAA typically puts on every year a domestic violence as well as a sexual assault um, multi-day training. Um, and we work really hard to make sure that the presentations in those cases um, are trauma-informed as well. Excellent. Um, last one, and then I'll endeavor to get, there's a few more coming in that we're not going to be able to address, but I'll um, endeavor to get those connected with the speakers. Um, how do you um, how do you address getting a service dog or service animal in the courtroom when there might be reluctance on the part of judici judicial staff, example, for example, you know, how have folks had success in that? Sure. We have a program in San Diego where really it started on relationships built upon trust. So we would bring in our agency's positive teams and love on a leash, and we would just start with lunch and learns with the court staff. And really, you have to have a champion. So we tried to find the presiding judge or somebody who we knew could trickle down the information. And um, the more they see the dogs walking through, the more they realize the dogs aren't going to bark in their courtroom. They aren't going to leave presents on the floor in their courtroom. I mean, they will get used to this. Once they see the successes, that the kids' eyes light up, you know, before they have to go into one of the most scary and traumatic events, just being outside the courtroom and having that dog to comfort them. Um, we send newspaper articles. We've sent our judges um, research articles about the link um, of, of being trauma-informed by providing this, this support dog service. So relationships built upon trust, have them to lunch. You know, when the pandemic's done, take them to coffee, bring them to a lunch and learn, a uh, brown bag meeting at lunch, and just start the conversation. And additionally, be open to, okay, judge, how can we do this so that, because a lot of the judges are concerned about the impact on the jury, right? So figure out, can you, you know, bring your victim in while the jury's out of the courtroom? Can you settle the dog underneath the witness stand so the uh, jury can't see? And then the jury goes out after um, the victim comes off the stand. You know, think about those practical things and be ready to address them. Say, judge, if that's your concern, here's what we can do to ameliorate those concerns. Absolutely. I, I have never been denied allowing my victim to bring a support dog into the courtroom. They've been beside the victim under the witness bench and on the victim's lap. The only thing I strategize is my argument because obviously it's different in each of the three scenarios, but it's never been refused. And I, I don't know if you've had um, similar experiences or opposite, but again, I'm happy to talk offline uh, sort of about how this works. But I think Tracy and Adrian pretty much laid it out. If, if it's done correctly and, and buy-in is accomplished early on, we almost always win that one. And also in case there are judges on the call who have that concern, when we talk to people after, it almost becomes just, we didn't even recognize it at the end. You know, the victim will be testifying for hours and people will tell you, I didn't even recognize it. I forgot about it. And I think that's our goal, right? We don't want to be prejudicial. We don't want to be drawing attention to anything besides the evidence. This is simply a support tool for the survivor, similar to you know, a stress ball or something like that, that helps them through the process. Excellent. Thank you so much. That is our time. And I want to thank all three of you for uh, such a fantastic presentation and wish that you have a wonderful rest of your day and week. Thank you. Thank you for having thank us. Everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.